This is the urinary system part two. In part one, I discuss the basic function and structure of the kidney, walking through the nephron with emphasis on the renal corpuscle and the proximal tubules. In this tutorial, we'll continue reviewing the basic histology and functions of the rest of the nephron. The nephron loop, the distal tubule, collecting tubules and ducts, which adjust the filtrate and resorb water, and we'll then finish up with the ureter and bladder. And I'm Dr. Catherine Moore, the histology wizard. Now let's start with the nephron loop, or the loop of Henle, or Henle's loop. Henle's loop is the continuation of the proximal straight tubules and is located in the medulla. This is a U-shaped structure that consists of a thin descending limb, a thin ascending limb, and a thick ascending limb. In this micrograph, you can compare the thin limb with its typical low squamous epithelium with the thicker, simple cuboidal epithelium of the thick ascending limb. Now it's impossible to tell in a histological section whether you're looking at a thin descending limb or a thin ascending limb. And it's also difficult to tell the thin limbs from capillaries. In this image, the thin limbs are marked by the blue arrows and the blood vessels are marked with the red arrows. And they're pretty hard to tell apart, except that the vessels contain red blood cells. Now the thick ascending limb is easier to visualize in the medulla. Here we have our medullary ray and I've marked the proximal straight tubule. And you can appreciate that they have few visible nuclei and fuzzy lumens. Now compare those to the thick limbs where you can see more visible nuclei and the lumens are not quite as fuzzy. The loop of Henle and the connective tissue that surrounds it are involved in further adjusting the salt content of the filtrate. So an important take home message here is that the thick ascending limb is impermeable to water. And what this means is that the fluid that exits the medulla or the medulla is hypotonic. The cuboidal cells of the thick ascending limb are going to actively transport sodium and chloride out of the tubule. This is against their concentration gradients and they'll go into the interstitium which will make it hypertonic. And that causes water to move out of the thin descending limb which will then concentrate the urine. Now meanwhile that thin ascending limb will absorb sodium chloride but not water. Now this is the countercurrent flow and it's going to establish a gradient of osmolarity in the medulla interstitium and that effect will multiply the deeper we go into Henle's loop. If you need to understand this process better, there are a lot of great videos on YouTube that would describe it quite well. Now the thick ascending limb is also a major target of loop diuretics, which are going to inhibit that sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the thick ascending limb cells. Now I want to step aside for a minute here to talk about the blood supply in the nephron because it affects kidney physiology. There are two subsets of nephrons in the kidney. First we have cortical nephrons and we have juxtamedullary nephrons. Both are shown here. Cortical nephrons, as the name implies, reside fully in the cortex and the glomeruli are further from the corticomedullary junction. Now these nephrons have a very short loop of Henle and importantly, the efferent arterial is going to supply capillaries called the peritubular capillaries. In contrast, the juxtamedullary nephron has a glomerulus that's close to that corticomedullary junction, and it has a long loop of Henle. So it's these nephrons that establish that high salt gradient in the medulla. In this case, the efferent arterial supplies a capillary bed called the vasorecta. So let's sum this up. In the cortex, we have the glomerular and paratubular capillaries, and we have the longer vasorecta in the medulla. Let's take a closer look with those two systems. Paratubular capillaries arise from the efferent arterioles of cortical nephrons, and in this image, you can see both the renal corpuscle and the top of a proximal convoluted tubule and some of the capillaries surrounding it. With the juxtamedullary nephrons, the efferent arteriole becomes the arteriole rectae, then it loops to become the venae rectae, and the capillary plexi in between those link the two. The importance of the vasa recta is twofold. It supplies the long medulla with blood, and it maintains that high salt concentration, which is vital for final urine concentration. Again, there are a lot of great YouTube videos that describe this process, which is known as the countercurrent exchange. I encourage you to look at them. 
This image shows a section through an entire kidney where you can fully appreciate the long blood capillaries of the vasa recta. And a closer view shows the vessels within the medulla beside the different tubules. Okay, now let's head back to our examination of the rest of the nephron. After the thick ascending limb, the filtrate enters the distal tubule, which is straight in the medulla and medullary rays, and then it becomes more tortured in the cortex. Now it's pretty hard to tell the difference between the thick ascending limb and the straight part of the distal tubule, particularly when we get close to that renal corpuscle. So while most sources will state that the distal tubule forms the macula densa, which I'll talk about next, some sources do call this the thick ascending limb. And in any case, what's important is the function of the macula densa. So when the distal tubule contacts the arterioles at the vascular pole of the renal corpuscle, the cells are going to become more columnar and closely packed together, and they form the structure seen at this arrow, the literal thicker spot, or macula densa. The macula densa is part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is a sensory structure that utilizes feedback mechanisms to regulate glomerular blood flow. And this is so that the glomerular blood flow stays relatively constant. So let's take a look at this apparatus. We'll do that first in a cartoon. So here's a familiar cartoon where you can see the vascular pole with the afferent and efferent arterioles and the top of the distal convoluted tubule. The aqua colored cells represent the macula densa. The purple cells are those extra glomerular mesangial cells. And the darker blue cells are the juxtaglomerular cells. And these are smooth muscle cells or modified smooth muscle cells that are also modified to secrete a specific protease called renin. Together, these structures comprise the juxtaglomerular apparatus. In this H&E stained section, you can appreciate the macula densa, the extraglomerular mesangial cells, and the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole. This next section doesn't have a macula densa in view, but you can see the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferent arteriole, which in this case are stained for renin. So what does this apparatus actually do? Well, the basic function is to aid in auto-regulation of the glomerular filtration rate and to help control blood pressure. The flow rate is controlled by adjusting the formation of the initial filtrate. And that filtrate formation can be controlled by constriction of the afferent and efferent arterioles. The job of the macula densa in this process, which is called tubuloglomerular feedback, is to sense the flow rate, and its cells do this by monitoring the sodium chloride content of the fluid in the distal tube. Now, while a full discussion of tubuloglomerular feedback is beyond the scope of this tutorial, let's consider briefly what happens when the distal tube fluid contains too much sodium chloride. Here we have that image again showing the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, when sodium chloride levels are high in the distal fluid, the cells of the macula densa detect this and signal to the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole. The afferent arterial cells then constrict, and this constriction decreases filtration pressure on the glomerulus, which decreases the initial filtrate, and eventually this causes the sodium chloride levels to lower. Now this is a relatively simple feedback loop. But what happens when the sodium chloride levels are too low is much more complicated, and we won't go into it here. Now histologically, what does the distal tubule look like? Well, the cells are simple cuboidal cells, they lack a brush border, and their lumens are more empty compared to proximal tubule cells. These cells are the target of thiazide diuretics, and they're also a target of aldosterone and ADH, although mostly at their most terminal regions. At their most terminal regions, they join a short connecting tubule, which then merges to form collecting tubules, which later merge to form collecting ducts. In this section, you can see the differences between the proximal tubules and the distal tubules, with both cell height and looking at the visible nuclei. All right, moving on to the collecting tubules, we know that these tubules carry the filtrate into collecting ducts, and those are formed by the merging of tubules, so they often have branches. These become larger and straighter the deeper you go into the medulla. And the ductal epithelial cells also change, becoming columnar 
and now they're termed principal cells. So the collecting ducts of the medulla will be the final sites of water reabsorption from the filtrate. So this is really the final concentration of the urine. And the ductal cells are regulated by both aldosterone and ADH. And I'll briefly touch on the functions of those in a minute. First, let's look at this image again from the medullary rays, where I've labeled both a proximal tubule and some collecting ducts. So note the differences. The collecting ducts have the most visible nuclei, and you can clearly see the connections between cells. And this makes sense. These ducts carry very concentrated filtrate, and we need to keep that from our tissues. So although we can't see them, these cells have lots of tight junctions to prevent leaks. And in addition, the lumens are quite clear, especially compared to the proximal tubules. Now these images of the medulla in cross-section show again the clear lumens and the tall columnar cells that are joined tightly together. And you can also see some of the vessels of the vasa recta. As I mentioned previously, aldosterone acts to stimulate sodium recovery, and it does this by opening sodium channels on the apical surface of the collecting ducts and tubules. At the same time, it increases the sodium-potassium ATPase on the basal lateral membrane. And so this allows sodium to move from the lumen of the tubule through the epithelial cells into the interstitium and into the blood. Now in contrast, antidiuretic hormone affects water transport directly. So we know that low ADH is going to cause water elimination via dilute urine, while high ADH is important for water recovery and concentrated urine. So when, here we have a diagram of part of the nephron, and when ADH is high, it causes vesicles containing aquaporins to insert into the plasma membrane of collecting tubules and collecting ducts. And this then causes water to flow into the epithelial cells, which effectively will concentrate the urine. After the collecting ducts perform their final alterations or concentrations of the filtrate, the ducts will merge again to form the papillary ducts. And this filtrate is now considered urine. It's next collected in the minor calyces and then the major calyces, and eventually exits into the ureter. Now from the ureter, urine collects in the bladder and ex exits through the urethra and out of the body. And the epithelium is going to change from urothelium to stratified squamous epithelium. Let's look at a section of the ureter. So the ureter has that specialized epithelium or urothelium, and here it's about four to five cell layers thick. It also has a lamina propria of dense irregular connective tissue, but it lacks a submucosa. It does have a relatively organized muscularis layer, sort of, and it undergoes periodic peristalsis. And finally, it has a connective tissue adventitial layer. Now recall from your knowledge of epithelium that urothelium contains specialized umbrella cells in its top layer, and they function in expansion of the tissue. The urinary bladder resembles the ureter, but it has a thicker layer of urothelium, but it has a lamina propria, muscularis, and adventitial layers. Now, unlike the ureter, the bladder does contain a submucosal layer of dense irregular connective tissue. So let's just go quickly back to the umbrella cells. These are very interesting cells. They have an interesting adaptation in that they contain these disc-like vesicles that can be added to the surface. So this is how the bladder actually can expand to accommodate urine. So when the bladder is full, we can't see these vesicles. Now that we've made it all the way to the bladder, We've traveled from the glomerulus and the renal corpuscle through the tubule system. We've recovered water, reabsorbed important substances, and secreted harmful or toxic substances into the filtrate and eventually formed urine. If you missed the first part of this trip, head on back to part one of the urinary system. Be sure to check out, like, and comment on my other videos. Suggestions and topics always welcome. Thanks for stopping by.